Would you please check your ideas and opinions at the door? All your philosophical and religious views, all your logic, because I say check it at the door advisedly because you can pick it up again when you go out if you feel unsafe without it. I'm not trying to argue you out of your opinions and views. I'm merely suggesting that for the sake of an experiment, you temporarily suspend it. Hello and welcome to the Philosophical Minds Podcast, an exploration of all things philosophical, alchemical, and esoteric. From the psycho-spiritual to the material-chemical nature of the all. Join me and my guests as we inquire into the liminality of mind and matter, and tend to the fertile soils of awareness and perception, while facilitating an expanded consciousness from the individual to the collective. If you enjoy the show and find it of value, consider supporting and becoming a patron via the Patreon at patreon.com slash philosophicalminds. A small contribution makes a big difference and definitely makes it easier for me to continue the show. Although, I will always do my best to keep it flowing regardless. Thank you all, and let's get into it. Alright, today we are joined with a black belt freethinker, a timeline decoder, antiquitech analyst, analyst, the script buster, um, just all around great philosophical mind of our time, Andreas Exertus. Um, Andreas, never met you personally, but I've watched a lot of your videos. Um, there's actually a funny story. I actually was watching, it was probably like three months ago or something. I was just watching constantly a ton of your videos, and I actually had a dream that I cooked you a steak. So I don't know what that means, but I that's, thought it was hilarious. <laughs> that's base. Well, yeah. I hope you didn't cook it too much, you know, but yeah, I don't that's know. awesome. That's all I remember. I just thought that was funny. Um, well, I, 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 I do love to eat steak. It's kind of like fun. I used to be a vegan for a long time, and then I decided that I needed to start eating meat more. And yeah, I kind of now I'm, in the last couple of weeks, we're eating a lot of quinoa again and trying to find some balance. But I'm not sure what the steak metaphor is yet. You're muted too. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know what kind of like Jungian archetype that that might represent or whatnot, but <laughs> it's pretty funny. Um, so I love your channel and like all the content that you've been putting out. You've got like a vast scope of understanding across a variety of topics and disciplines and just a super like unique ability to act as a bridge in many ways for all different groups so i think that's awesome um so i'm stoked to get into tartaria uh first i want to touch on you and your background because you're a fascinating human um so yeah maybe we can touch on your background how you kind of grew up what influenced your development uh some of your education your learning practices any of that yeah, sure. Okay. So I am Andreas and I am a nanotechnician, uh, engineer. Um, let's see. I want to start that over again because it's like, it's not who I am anymore. It's like who I was. So I went to school as long as they made me go. And then I kept going longer just because then I didn't have to get a job for a while. And somehow the last thing I could study was nanotechnology. So eventually I started working with graphene and I started learning more and more about the intricacies of the future. And they're saying, well, the future is coming, but it's really expensive. The past is already, you know, it, we, we have, uh, I want to do this again. Hold on. Sorry. Let's start this back. Okay. Um, okay. So, all right, my name is Andreas Nicholas, and no, gosh, this is weird. I haven't done this in a while, so I, I got a little, it's no shake it out. I'm going to shake time. it out. We got this, and we'll, we'll okay. cut it up all nice and beautifully. So, Cool. <laughs> One second. Well, my name is Andreas, and I am a nanotechnician and social media engineer. I started working with graphene originally, and somehow I started getting more and more interested in history when I found out that there were things in, okay, this is so weird. Like for some reason, it's just not, let me just, hold on, got this. 
it's so weird when someone asks you who you are, right? Because there's just so many things at once. I've never been asked, so I yeah, I, I don't know. I can only imagine. Uh. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I can re-ask the question. We can go a different route if you want. Let's see, like engineer, uh, social media, Tartaria. CNN. Okay. CNN and NASA. Basically the most important things. Okay. I can do this. All right. Covering it all. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm Andreas and I used to work for NASA and CNN. I was a social media strategist for them and designed, you know, basically the meta tags, which led to their websites and Twitter feeds. And I was in charge of CNN Twitter during uh, flight 370. Right. So that's kind of when I realized that there was a lot of fake news out there. And when I started learning about fake news, I realized that there was fake history, which was just old fake news. And learning about technology, uh, when I was working at NASA, I was building you know, fabrication systems, trying to learn about using old fabrication systems so that we don't have to build new, more expensive ones to build graphene. And we figured we could use like lasers from disk scribes and start finding out, oh wait, all this stuff that's existed for so long before it. I got more and more interested in history just kind of randomly. So eventually I heard about Tartaria and Tartaria is this like lost civilization like Atlantis. So for whatever reason, my interest in free uh, technology and also this idea of fake news and fake history, I started finding out, wait, there's a lot going on here um, and that's, that's, you know, how I started recent Tartarians and Tartary Nova and the Exertus project is, you know, that's basically what I knew now. That's epic. So you mentioned, uh, the graphene work. So I'm sure that you have heard a lot of the speculation with the vaccine situation. What are your personal thoughts on that? Like, do you think that that's a potential valid, uh, a valid, um, uh, concern as a possibility or what, what are your thoughts on about, about that i mean i think people are more eager I, or should be more eager to understand how to use technology so adenovirals are really exciting you know things like this idea that we can mutate dna um it can be a positive thing and so when i was a kid we were learning things like genome compiler which is you know, there's Promoter CAD, which is one of the programs that you run to build DNA sequences, and you can send them to labs, and you can build an adenoviral that can mutate. A, a, you, you'll be able to create a tolerance, and then your DNA will uh, mutate to take whatever sequence that you want in that promoter sequence and inject it into your DNA. So you can create rather than you can. Well, tar there's carcinogenic. There's also teratogenic effects, which will only affect your offspring. But you can set it up so that it affects you directly right now. And a big part of genetic evolution is this idea that two parts are needed because they wear down and the future is different. So we don't know exactly, even if everything worked forever perfectly, uh, if the world around it would be the right world for that gear. So eventually things hybridize and then they keep hybridizing. And this way, things can predict what future outcomes based on the present make the most sense if we replace that with adenovirals there's actually like a huge benefit because you can endure all sorts of different things you can change right but there could also be recreational changes like you could have blue hair if you wanted to so there, there doesn't have to be this big negative spin on it um and i think the biggest thing is like look at the track record for how the elite use technology and you haven't seen that technology used yet in that way for instance like cloning or genetic modification we have it we're using cloning all the time most of the meat is cloned right for instance um and genetic modification where's the giant corn right we, we could we should have giant cherries the size of watermelons by now for whatever reason we're just not using the technology in that way so it's, i think it's more important to see why are they trying to say everything is same they're, they're not really working on better they're saying this is the same so they can legally say that this is something other than you know this is something we should be probably con concerned about more why are why are they worried about us knowing and disclosing to us the the, the rationale behind an adenoviral 
you know, things like that. But this is, you know, you talk about this, you'll probably get in trouble for the most part. That's why I think in general, we should probably be careful about talking about adenovirals. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Um, real quick, I wanted to see if you could elaborate on, did you have some kind of Jesuit uh, education background? Uh, may, so I went to a different school pretty much every year growing up. And so I did have, um, I have a Jesuit godfather and my mom went to Jesuit school and my father went to Jesuit school and I didn't go to a Jesuit university. I ended up going to University of California in Santa Cruz and in Los Angeles and in, I mean, in San Diego and um, a number of different, you know, locations, just basically even through elementary school, I went to a few Catholic schools, but I basically went to a different school every year. I went to a Protestant school once. I think kindergarten, I went to a school where it was Christian, but the ladies who ran it were lesbian and, or decided they were and that God was a woman and that she was lesbian as well. And so that they didn't want to have any more boys for first grade. So we had to leave. And that's when I went to public school for a year. So I tried all the different schools, you know. That's dope. Um, that's funny. I asked because there are a group of people who they have a very kind of uh, harsh opinion about Jesuits. I'm curious from your perspective as somebody who has close ties or, you know, had literally been partially raised. I'm curious, what's your perspective? And if you could elaborate on a little bit about just the overall nature of like Jesuits in general. <laughs> so what's up with the Jesuits? Yeah, All right. What's the deal? Well, so, I mean, Catholicism is a really misunderstood thing. Jesuitism is a misunderstood thing. Freemasonry is a misunderstood thing. So it is what it is. And I guess the first thing you'd say is Catholicism really means, okay, let's start with this. Do you care what the real meaning of something is, or do you care what people believe it is? That's a huge difference. It's a voodoo capitalism there. So people think Catholicism means you know, didactic and like, we're going to tell you what to think. Really what it means is universalism. So it's like the Tao, you're supposed to see this holistic view. And the Jesuits are the ones who seem to originally have been kind of open to this, but, you know, look at their history also. They were kicked out of every country in the world. There's the Jesuit suppression because they were killing kings of Europe. They were trying to assassinate the Portuguese king. And eventually the Jesuits had to assassinate and poison their way back into the Vatican. They killed the Pope, dug up the body of the dead Pope who excommunicated them, um, put him on trial, took his soul out from hell, you know, from heaven and put him in hell, supposedly, so that they could then you know, erase history. So the Jesuits do have kind of a cloudy background, but at the same time, you know, there's, you got to admit, like they run the best math and science schools in the world and they're pretty interesting people the usage of well exorcism i think is it shows you how powerful they are and the fact that they also have jesuit ignatian method spiritual exercises some people are a little freaked out by that but it's really just knowing how to use your imagination so i'd say like the ignatian exercises are probably more powerful than just about anything than anyone else is doing like in terms of technology internal technology or external technology the Ignatian method and spiritual exercises will make, make it possible for you to realize and manifest your, your ambitions, your dreams. And, and, you know, there's a lot more going on with the Jesuits than people realize. For instance, to be a Jesuit, you have to get 20 years deep into helping some school somewhere. Like you have to have a PhD. It's, it's a lot more complicated than people think. Like to become a Jesuit is way more difficult than to be in the CIA. So, you know, much respect that's fascinating i figured you'd have an interesting response um all right tartaria uh what is tartaria i guess you could just start anywhere you want on this one and and yeah so just go ahead <laughs> brutal okay so <laughs> tartaria tartaria uh is is i think um the best way to put it now has become a colloquialism it used to be the name of what the xenophobic uh, 
Western and, you know, people outside of Tartaria, as we're calling it, would call it this, would call it Tartaria. You know, they'd say, hey, over there is this land of the vegetable sheep. It's so far east. It's so far west. It's beyond. But it's the super big, awesome thing. And it's kind of like the Phoenicians. Like we, we now know that the Phoenicians never referred to themselves as the Phoenicians, literally. Um, but that it was, you know, the term that we use because of the phonemes and it relates to tear and tar. And so you start to find tar in all sorts of things, you know, and Berber and Barber and tar, tar. The, the phonemes and symbols, it, it's not so relevant necessarily whether or not it was Tartar or Tartar, you know, eventually you see that there's a, a civilization and that's the most important part, the civilization that was very advanced. We've heard of Rome, we've heard of, you know, Iran, Persia, Babylon. But what if, what about, you know, and we've heard about Atlantis, but what about Tartaria? Well, you start looking on maps, you'll see that in the old maps, Tartaria was all over the place. And there's, you know, a lot of stories about Tartaria. At the beginning of Star Trek Enterprise, Scott Bakula, I just recognized a couple of weeks ago, you know, there's the Tartaria map. You know, you see it at the very beginning of the 2001 show. So Tartaria is a very pervasive idea. The CIA started trying to get the Soviets interested in Tartaria because on the map, Tartaria had been for the longest point in Crimea and also to uh, parts of Khazaria into Georgia. So, you know, they were saying, hey, you guys who are now part of this, uh, you know, internationalist union that's planning on being more than just a Soviet union that wants to be United Nations replacement that's Soviet, um, tell them to be nationalists, tell them about the Tartars and not just the Tartars, but also Tartaria. Tartaria being, well, you know, this, we have stories, folklore, that there was these, you know, there were these magical people that lived in magical houses and had magic technology. At the end of the day, it's not so much magic. The magic turns out to be a technology that makes, it, it cleans something, it turns on lights at night, it does things that are impossible. But it's not really impossible. It just, it's beyond what can be explained by the people at the time. So instead, they say this technology is a magic. But clearly, Tartaria is this place that had this advanced technology. And some of the people that have technology in the 1300s and the 1600s, when they start to talk about technology in you know, Cordoba in Spain, because Spain is part of this Arabic uh, trade union, the Cordoba Caliphate, um, it connects all the way to what is where Tartaria is on maps now. And again, Tartaria was an entire world wide confederacy of trade but we have places where the ashkenazi and the crimean uh georgian peninsula the, up into the 1870s and 1890s tartaria still stays on maps and now tartarstan is a state in russia that is the remnants of what's left because the soviet union took it completely killed as many people as, as possible took kulaks and then took their land and eventually they moved them into you know different parts of russia eventually the, the the remnants are today tartarstan but what we know now uh is that most of the world it's like babylon everyone has a little piece of the culture islam buddhism the half of both it seems come from their interpretations of what the religions were like at the time of tartaria and that also seems to have been connected to the Maslow hierarchy of need. We know that they had a lack of scarcity. There was, you know, clearly access to resources. They had free energy because they were, they were like Nikola Tesla style uh, water systems. And we have all sorts of evidence of this. Um, we should go into that. But yeah, that's basically the thing. Once we found out that Tartaria existed and that there were archaeological uh, sites that we could go to that was the beginning yeah that's it's so fascinating uh how i how i got into learning about it was through looking into the old world fairs and you know searching through all of these various photographs from chicago or san francisco the expositions and looking at and then coming across articles that kind of got into the Tartaria thing and I think that's and you popped up eventually and went really deep on it on a podcast that I had listened to and so that one is a really fascinating piece for me because it it's in the United States it's these old structures that there are still remnants of to this day 
Some of them may have been converted into schools. Some of them may have been converted into uh, modern day capital buildings, for example. Could you touch on that a little bit? Sure, yeah. So you, you start looking at uh, Carnegie's mansions or the post office or the water and power places in San Francisco, in New York City, um, Missouri, and anywhere where the trains are. And you start to see that these architectural marvels are on top of these tunnel systems and that they're embedded into the ground. There are some kinds of buildings that are built to be in the ground that actually have basements, but some of these buildings have windows that are completely, there's dirt above them. So there's all sorts of stories about mud floods. Well, you know, you look in Peru and you can see today there are still mud floods that are happening all the time where land is just carried off you know dirt and sediment are also rising up because of liquefaction um with what's the uh, uh hydroelectric damming systems there are circumstances where an entire town will be flooded like in that uh, movie what's it called um oh brother where art thou you know the entire town is just buried in water and then a thousand years later or who knows they divert it and all of a sudden now we have towns that are being unburied like, oh a cathedral that we found in peru that's underwater but now it's, it's it's been dried out but it's been underwater for centuries since they diverted a river to build some sort of a dam or some sort of a, you know this has been going on for a long time so eventually you'll also see you know sherman neckties are the railroads from the confederacy that were the union yankees came through and bent the confederate railroads supposedly this is probably false we know now that there were environmental disasters volcanoes earthquakes all sorts of things that were happening um and also nepotism that led to the fall of this civilization and afterwards people took over what they could so places like utah you see deseret Deseret's this uh, Brigham Young and, and Joseph Smith idea of a Mormon state that was built of, you know, supposed to go to California and take up all of what was old California, which includes Arizona, uh, Nevada, Washington, and Oregon, alongside of, you know, California, this giant place that goes all to Utah. And they had their own language and everything else that they were designing, and they'd worked with the U.S. government. They, the U.S. government said, hey, we'll let you have a Mormon state deseret if you help us in the california spanish american war so the mormons were really close to that well they're on top of the ruins that they say this is the other thing the mormons tell you the story the most ironic part is well the, it's like it's like kind of like when you read national Enquirer, but it's backwards like well the official story is according to the mormons that this is where you know the the deluge happened noah's children uh, Noah's sons' wives are the different groups of, of men that came to America, and they're in this place, and that we have these tunnel systems here that are on, underneath these giant temples that were built originally, and that they fell, but we rebuilt them, and in circumstances where they fell, that we had to put them back together, we had to learn how to use the technology that was saved by Freemasonry, which was you know divested by these you know certain knight families from the Jesuits who had been carrying it from, oh man, I forget his name now, but if somebody who knows about Freemasonry can remember Hiram Abyss, there it is. Good job, Hiram Abyss. You know, then you'll know that this is all part of the the architectural story. Hey, who built the pyramids? Who built the electric systems for these towers? Why does this technology exist? Well, Atlantis is one of the cities of Tartaria. Now, you look at Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma. He talks about Tartaria about seven times. Both uh, mentions of the, 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 the Tartarian people are said to have been their, their, their land and their value and their inheritance is being taken from them because they don't deserve it, because they don't know how to use it right, right? And so this is where we're at. We're at this point where a reset is right now being talked about even now. We're saying this is a new civilizational reset that has to happen because otherwise the Club of Rome's computer system has predicted that... We won't be able to sustain the feeding system and then we'll all die. You know, just not just a few, everyone will die. And if that happens, it'll be, well, you know, an increase of value for the individual, but more difficult for us to synergize and make things happen. So we need to force, right? This is because they say that there was another reset that already happened. And what happened then? Well, you had, if you remember, 
remember in recent history memories, orphans, foundlings carried off on other sides of the world, the beginning of a new world with new names, new language, where nobody remembers where they come from. And it's interesting how recently that happened, right? Like that already is not that long ago that you ask most people in America, you know, where did they come from and how long has this been? It's not that many generations back. Now, even weirder, ask people in Italy or in Germany, you know, because Germany wasn't a country 200 years ago. So that makes it a lot more interesting when you think about it. There are Prussians and there's Rhinelanders and there's people that were Deutsch that you know, same with Italy. Italy is a completely new thing. There are people that think that they're Italian, but they might have come there from Croatia or they might have come from Portugal or something. So everyone's been mixed around in Europe, you know, and you'll find people in France with the name like, a, you know, Italian, you know, whatever, like Romanson or something. So, so much of what we think of as being more like a thousand years old in Europe is really only 200 years as well. Yeah, that's fascinating. And one thing in particular that you mentioned briefly a while ago was Ashkenazi. And this is interesting to me because I have 10% Ashkenazi blood. So I had mentioned that to somebody at one point and they're like, oh, that's related to Judaism. And I was like, I don't, I don't know. I think it's a little different. Um, there's controversy about that whole thing. But I'm curious from your perspective, I think you may have mentioned something along the, the lines of Ashkenazi linking to Kazarian bloodline. Um, I don't know if that's a well. That's a so that that's a that's like a Wikipedia uh, will tell you that that's a theory that some people okay. have, and it's not completely proven and etc. Okay. But what's interesting about the Ashkenazi, you know, as far as what the Ashkenazi believe themselves, is that there are twelve tribes. There's supposed to be a hidden third thirteenth lost tribe to some people. That some beliefs according to the Zohar I mean people have interpreted that this is the case and if you look at the world in general this idea of there being uh, 13 tribes that have been um, it's very theosophic it's very Blavatsky so I think that there is a lot to be said about um, humanity having you know lineages that go back and are are the, the, there's a there's a power to gene flow that might even like this David Icke thing, right? Where there's like, there's magic and we're all connected. That's great. I think that that's completely plausible. Um, I don't think it's a bad idea to care about DNA and genetics. I, I think it's important if you look at what 23andMe is doing and everyone else, they're trying to tell you that politically it's, it's incorrect to be interested in DNA or also that you should hate somebody or whatever, just because you're interested in um, the Babylon system all the way back to the original seed, but they're interested in it. And there's a lot of value, not just for your insight, but for them to make money off you if you don't know, and they do. So it's probably worth it to find out the truth about everything. But at the end of the day, I kind of believe we all go back to uh, similar uh, circumstances and familial. So it's kind of funny, I think, like racism is a bad way to go about it because at some point we're all connected and Tartaria in general is, is a trade network that could not have existed if it weren't for the fact that there were people on an endless summer system on the other side of the world. It wasn't that Tartaria was black or white or, you know, whatever, like it's that everyone together could contribute. And if it was an ethno state, it would have become, uh, you know, like Edo period Japan, it would have been interesting, but it wouldn't have been the biggest possible thing it could be, you know, the Babylon system. Definitely. Uh, so star forts, these, these are really another fascinating aspect. Um, one in particular that is easily referenceable would be uh, like the Statue of Liberty. I, I believe that that's built on a star fort. Um, what are some other examples that you would be able to point out in terms of, I know they're all over the world, um, maybe you could touch a little bit on star forts and kind of what those structures are and how they tie into this whole narrative. Cool, are you able to hear me? It just uh, it was cutting you out there for a second. Yeah, I, I can yeah, hear you, okay. Cool. Um, yeah, so star forts in general, uh, actually yesterday I was doing some, I was talking to a guy who didn't even know that they existed, but had been researching them for the last year, because he's a professor in Canada, and he's been doing LIDAR uh, on Fort, I think Edwin was the first one, Fort Edwin and Fort Anne, and there's a few other forts that you can look up if you start looking looking for forts and i remember at the beginning when we were doing this people said there's not that many of these there's a few bastion forts but there's some anomalies that are clearly older than that 
And what are we going to do? So now we know that the whole original history is rubbish and that everyone has to update their Wikipedia. I think actually they've done this a number of times because what we know, we now know are that star forts have existed for thousands of years. They're all over the world. They're not just from 15th, 16th century Italy. They are in Russia. Uh, they're in Africa. They're in Hawaii. They're in California. We in California is a big, all right. When I first started looking into this stuff, I was confused to find that there wasn't a lot of ruins in certain places in California, but there were in other places. And what was the deal? Oh, California had a gold rush and they melted, they used dynamite and water and they removed parts of hills. So it was really hard to find evidence of certain kinds of things. But when you start looking for star forts in Canada, like, well, we couldn't find them up until this last year when we used LIDAR. And so LIDARs, I've been looking with a lot of, as many people as I can who work with LIDAR to find star forts around the world. And sure and behold, anywhere where we were having problems for the last few years, which was basically the Western hemisphere up in the North hemisphere was, was very difficult. And certain parts of East Africa, you know, we hadn't found them for at first, but we started finding them in, in Botswana. Uh, you know, I'm skipping ahead though, because I guess the first thing is that we'd already found them all over the world before that, like in Copenhagen and in, in, in Holland, there are still star forts that people live in, like these entire cities that are these giant Mario Brothers snowflake shapes. And you look on Google Maps and you'll start to find them everywhere. You go to Lima, one of the big uh, star forts is a military base. And you start finding a lot of, there's one in Taipei, in ta Tainan, Tainan in uh, Taiwan. So many of these old star forts have become military bases. It makes sense. It's, and that's one of the reasons why they say bastion forts are designed for military purposes. But they think of them as military purposes for shooting in every direction. Not all of these are symmetrical stars. A lot of them are at angles, and they're almost always invariably around a river. So more likely than they are to be shooting at people, therefore diverting water and making a flow which then stops the stagnation of water and then makes it possible to have a community because of course the community needs water. So this is a very practical way to build the city. So the other thing is when you start looking for Atlantis, Atlantis is described in this ring system and it has a certain amount of points to it. And you're like, oh wait, 23 miles. Oh man, this is basically a star fort. There's a number of 23 mile star forts all over the world, Mauritania, um, in Spain, you know, Portugal. People thought Atlantis was one or the other. We're starting to find evidence of a number of Atlantis-like sovereign city-states that would connect together in this trade network of Tartaria. So Herodotus was probably talking about one of the cities of Tartaria in the you know, North African coast. Wow. Yeah, it's so cool. Um, I've I've kind of been like thinking on this and entertaining and playing with different ideas in regards to star forts and so it's cool to get your feedback and I've ran across a ton of star forts where basically like you were saying um, like a river often runs through a portion of the star fort there's I think there's one like a uh, in Geneva Switch Switzerland uh, Dresden Germany Croatia I want to say Saint Petersburg um, but anyway there's there's a handful and so it's like one point the the star fort where maybe maybe all maybe they were all one unified thing and over time with changes geologically maybe they'd become separated or something and so the reason i kind of thought this was interesting was because if if they were man-made fortresses um they were probably made in a time prior to those geological changes or maybe they weren't originally man-made and man moved in after because strategically speaking uh that wouldn't be very advantageous to construct one of these in a location that i could be wrong but i, I don't see them being like you, you like there's ones where like three quarters of the star fort are over here and then there's like a quarter across the river or something like that and it seems kind of ridiculous yeah that would, that would have to it, see, it has to be that way. That's the thing because it's a natural usage of the river. And you start to see how they can put the water into a place that, you know, this is how aqu aqueducts are a major part of this. You look in Mexico and they have these stories of an aqu aqueduct being built uh, by someone in the 1800s who must have learned how to do it exactly like a Roman. And they it's with the lost technology. And then they have everyone in Mexico build it okay we'll tell you how to do it no all over the world there are these aqueduct systems that connect together these star forts 
And the star forts, it, the other thing about it is that you were saying, is it here? Is it here? I think there was one there. They're everywhere. If you start looking at maps, the whole world was covered in a cityscape of some, of some kind. It wasn't a terrifying strip mall like it is now. And the roads had more logic that had incorporated water in a better way. But that's kind of what we're talking about doing. That's the back to the future too that we're looking for, right? Like eventually we're going to get there. The irony being, it's already been done and we have feedback loops to show you what happens when you move water from one place to another and the rain can't catch it eventually it turns certain places to desert and we have to be very careful if we're not using perfect math right and there's there, you can in the old days computers were just what you'd call a guy who had a book in a boat and he was able to tell you with winch chill factor how to throw your cannonball so it hit the other boat that was going at the right speed he just had the numbers and he had the the, the formulas in a book and he knew how to do that but now we have computers that can do the same thing so we can rebuild tartaria but the thing about these star forts is in general they're already there and if we follow the path and where they were and we see what they were there's a reason why they are that shape you go to bolivia and you start to see that there are natural shapes you're saying these are man-made right well look in salta there's all this salt that's <laughs> turned into this hexagonal sheet that's 100 miles in every direction. Actually, I think it's more than that. And it's these hexagons because naturally the resonance of the salt crystals build it into this you know, resonance pattern. When you start taking star fort shapes and you look at climatic patterns, if you look at the windows in uh, Notre Dame, I, I hope that they're still there. Um, those windows are in the shapes of certain climatic patterns, which are certain frequencies. So part of the deal is that this is living in accordance with natural law and living in accordance with nature. Um, it's sort of like the opposite of building cell phone towers because you're listening for what the frequency is and trying to put yourself on that frequency. And the benefit of that, one of the thoughts of these towers or these cata, um, what do you call these cathedrals, cathedrals, the four cornered walls is that, you know, Royal Rife was a guy who talks a lot about sound healing. And now we're using sound healing to get rid of um, grains inside, you know, like you can do, you can kill cancer with sound. So the, in the old days, you could go and listen to an organ in one of these cathedrals and you'd, it would, it would put you on the same frequency resonance and the parts of you that aligned would jive and the parts of you that didn't would fall by the wayside. And that would be a way to um, that plus fasting would help with cancer. I mean, I know that sounds very new age, but it's also very old, primitive technology. Hundred percent. Yeah. No, that that's where I was actually gonna going with that is, in thinking about how they may have originated, aside from the perspective of the man made, uh, of the man made perspective. Uh, like reflecting on discussions that I've had with folks about things like ether physics and how the stars or luminaries essentially encode uh, into matter specific structural forms energetically with these kind of cosmic formative forces that essentially are like en encoded into matter, whether it's herbs or fruits or seeds or whatever in, in nature. It, it, it's like there's a, it really illustrates how form gets expressed due to uh, planetary influences with their orbits and such I, th I, th I think it's called like there's something called cosmological botany and it's there's a particular one where it describes like the orbital pattern of venus over an eight-year cycle and how that geometry uh becomes displayed and it creates a pretty much identical five-pointed star shape that's akin to what you would see if you were to slice open an apple um but that could be you know coincidence or i don't think it is but I, I, I was thinking maybe historically when there wasn't so much maybe electromagnetic radiation and whatnot polluting the atmosphere or maybe different conditions or forms of radiant energies or circumstances for whatever reason were more pure to some degree to to where to where they had allowed for a more potent and powerful infiltration of cosmic formative forces to kind of like impress and embed themselves in some way into various locations on the earth to some degree maybe maybe something similar like that like with the vibrational sort of emanations so madame blavatsky right uh, darwin was more interested in her research i think than people realize and a lot of his information on uh gene flow comes from Blavatsky's ideas on root races and um, 
the Mu and Lemuria, right? Lemuria also, Le, Mu, you know, like, so this idea that there was, and also lemurs, you know, this idea that there was a lost continent and that the new continents that we are on are the new raised turtle backs and that the old ones have sunk into the sea. So there's an into Africa theory and that the connections between them have completely changed um, what we understand as humanity. And that's a part of why the idea that there would be different kinds of humans which are so closely related that we can cross uh pollinate or you know gene flow we can have gene flow which is an amazing thing because lots of animals can't do that like you can't take certain kind but the fact that we are very different too that neanderthals and denisovan and floriensis and all these different kinds of human are so different is it this is something that well the sumerians and the bible and islam even talks about you know giants epic of gilgamesh talks about this idea of two-thirds god or anunnaki there could very well be genetic modification going on i like that idea you look at the 23 um pairs versus the 24 pairs of our closest primate relatives so this idea that we have snipped information new information that's been added and lost a complete chromosome while also losing what 80% of our strength. So we're intelligent, but we're also um, incapacitated a little bit. I like that idea, but it's also, it seems a bit paranoid. So I, I don't worry too much about this idea of there being um, creators or manipulators necessarily. It seems like we're able to have enough of our own control. Having said that, are there tales of giants and are there evidence? Uh, is there evidence of those, of those giants existing? Smithsonian will probably almost at this point tell you yes like, i think we're almost ready to admit the fact that yes we're 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 one of many different kinds of things we are not the apex thing the reason i think they've tried to keep you from knowing that is because it, it freaks us out to think we're not the apex a hundred years ago you had to tell a guy he was the apex if a guy came in and he paid you a pound to see um, the british museum you told him that these clown monsters that came before him had peanut brains and that somehow all of the right choices made him and that he's beautiful. That was literally science, it seems like. And we've gotten to a point where we can almost admit that that's not true, that people have made mistakes, that uh, there's a, a rising action and a falling action often to uh, evolution or and also even that term, microgenetics and evolution has mainly to do with the choices of the parents and their interaction with each other, their choice to be with each other. So we're so Gattaca. We're like, hey, the future is going to be choosing the genetics and changing the child. You mean like it is? Because like basically we're forgetting we already have been doing that forever. So genetics have been holding on to, and this is one of the reasons why 23andMe I think is really important when you're looking at this reset history is where is this genetic information and where is it coming from because it is really different and it's not just random mutation this is some sort of specialized uh, mutation but it's it's unique and it's valuable and each one is important and it's not something where you can be like oh man i wish i had that one because i think everyone and it's kind of like when someone says i wish i was a giant well i mean i wish i was a dwarf sometimes like there's in, in ancient egypt you would have wanted a giant and a dwarf it, it, one without you can't have one without the other and though they would be magical so this idea that one kind of uh person you know is better uh, whether it's a giant or whether it's uh you know a certain ethnicity it's missing the point that there's so much genetic information there that really is it's, it's intelligent design and whether or not we want to admit it we have to figure out who designed it and how that happened because the fact that dna has a error correction system shows you it's not random and so that's important. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'm wondering if you've come to any conclusions or not conclusions, but maybe ideas about where all of your, le your where all of your research has led you to believe potentially that Tartaria, the the origins may have originated. I have a map on my wall. It's an old map, and ha it says Tartary. It's, I think it's in the area near the, the Caspian Sea or something along those lines. Um, I, I'm not sure if that, I'm sure that this has changed and there's tons of different maps with all over. So I'm, I'm wondering if from your research, is, is there any particular origin point or is it pretty much just all over? So at some point, 
people used to say tartar literally like or berber to mean not of you know here you know just that they were foreign it became common to do that in general and there are maps in the Terum, uh, Tartarum Bellicum is about America and Canada. And it's called, it's saying that America is Tartary. So this is where I, I think this is funny. We were told for so long that the uh, Marco Polo story is, fa- no, the Christopher Columbus, both, but the Christopher Columbus story is supposed to be false. We're told that all these stories are false, right? But how much of that story is true? I'm surprised. I really didn't know that that much. At first, I thought the whole thing was made up. Now I find that really, no, they were trying to find not really India, but Tartary, you know, and that Tartary, like China is, there's uh, uh, is Peter Fleming's book, Tales from Tartary, because they called China Tartary into the 20th century. You know, in general, there's hey, all of China and China is, now china but remember we're saying spain you know used to be five states and the united states is 50 you know so china is 300 little places that have been called china for a while like we're calling tibet china almost right so at a certain point we have to admit china was a lot of these other but okay yeah that was tartary at one point they were the most famous so uh, it's hard to say hey, they were the Tartarians, but what's interesting is we do see trade between them. So that's where you really find, hey, what, what really unites these people is uh, you'll find a Viking with an uh, Islamic ring, right, on, uh, or his wife will be from another country because they will have exchanged, um, and so you have xenophiles, people that love to explore and to travel and to trade, and they're the first to go. And they're not just on foot, they're on boat. So Tartary becomes more of an enterprise than just one location. And part of the idea of the enterprise is be on the other side of the equator, be there. When the winter comes here, it'll be summer there, have endless summer trade. So Tartaria ends up being, you know, everywhere. As far as, as far as if you type Tartaria into uh, archive.org, you will find manuscripts in the 13th century, 15th century, 17th century, everywhere. But specifically, the you look at russia and it's weird how we've divided the map in our classrooms where russia is like in california way on the other side but really if you just move that map over they're not that far like they're really like that's kind of the whole that's really where the map should be and so between those areas between russia and california well there are star forts in hawaii and everywhere in between and california itself was part of a russian territory you know alaska to california was nova angelisk at some point. So when you start to look into the connections to the Slavs and this idea that the Slavs and the Tartars and the Taters and the Cossacks, Taurus Bulba, well, it makes more sense that Tartaria was from Asia in your Eurasia into America. I mean, that's, but eventually you're like, wait, where does it stop? And that's, that's where it becomes complicated because there really isn't a point where it does. Wow. Yeah. That's super interesting. And Nova Angeles. So you were saying it was Nova Angeles uh, prior to Los Angeles? Uh, yeah. So Los Angeles, uh, I think, is 1600 or something like that. So, so, that makes... so it's like 1520s or something like that. And so, yeah. Cap- and that's also after San Francisco. So, Francisco goes up to Capitola. So, Santa Cruz has Capitola. So Capitola was the capital. So if you see like Zorro and things, really it's about Santa Cruz and Capitola, but then they move everything to Sacramento and the new capital of California is Sacramento. It used to be Monterey, but the reason they moved it is because the trains are up there and it connects up with the Utah Deseret system. Yeah. Okay. Cause it was making me wonder sort of, I was thinking about, you're talking about what part of the story might've been true. So I was thinking about like the early colonizers and how they wanted to kind of open up trade access to China, and that's why they took over areas like Arizona, uh, Utah, Nevada, California, and and thinking about that and the China connection. And then, but if I look if, even around here, I could look at all the roads, and there's roads like Guadalupe, or, or you see all these Mexican names on the roads. And I'm wondering if if prior to that, like you were saying with the Nova Angeles thing, if there was different names that got rewritten over on, if that was even more primitive than the the uh the spanish totally well for one thing spanish has like guadalajara and guadalupe are both from arabic and so a lot of spanish is from 
from Arabic because we were talking about Cordoba and how Spain was part of an Arabic country for a long time. If you say in Spanish, I wish, you say, ojalá, right? Which means, you know, oh, excuse me. You say, ojalá, which, ojalá means, you know, I pray to Allah, you know? And so Allah is, is not, the, not the God of Catholicism, but for whatever reason, the, they're still saying it in Spain and in Mexico. Most of them don't realize these words mean those things anymore. So in, in, in Moro Bay as another one, like it's named Moro Bay because the bay looks like the Moorish Bay. So the, the Arabic connection also with the Spanish Inquisition is that in, in a number of circumstances, people were told that they were gonna be killed if they didn't leave. And so they told them that they were really good Catholics, right? And then not only were they really great Catholics, but that they would help them go as far as possible away from Spain, to teach people about Catholicism. And so a lot of Arabs and you know, Jew, Jews and Muslims who escaped the Spanish Inquisition ended up in the most far re remote regions of America. Parts, you know, and this is one of the reasons why Mexican food is so good because it has Arabic flavors. It's a legitimate truth. There's a part of the, the, the donor kebab um, thing where they're doing the meat. A lot of that is connected to the the cooking and then also flatbreads and things like that so yeah i mean the, the the connection also to what was arizona i wish i had thought to do more research on arizona for this because you have the petrified forest there and so there's a number of places there was a number of places that used to be um you, silicon trees I, I think you've seen some of the stories about that i'm pretty convinced by the silicon tree story if you've been to the petrified forest and you've seen um the remnants it doesn't seem like a flash instant fossilization it looks like there actually were at some point trees that had been converted into um yeah, they'd been blasted in every direction after some sort of a, a disaster uh, colorado has the same thing it's interesting the arid zone and the color red these are places which are you know what is the story that there's some major apocalyptic turning to salt disaster that's in, in what is left in Arizona? There are people that have just like what, the Ashkenazi, no, the, what's the name of the people? The was that like uh, Anastasi? Is that right? Like a native tribe or something? The on the I think it's the Anastasi uh, Indians. I think are right. There's, there's the people that just disappeared that were living in Arizona and just picked up sticks and just they built a bunch of architecture. They just disappeared. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, but yeah, that that was interesting what you were talking about because there are some areas uh, in Arizona in particular. Actually, we had gotten some land out in a very rural area. And if you zoom out on the map, it literally looks like some parts of Africa, like the barren, red, just vast, deserted emptiness of it. Ironically, Africa has cities and snow this last uh, week, if you saw in the middle of the Sahara. So things are changing. But yeah, yeah poor sure. Arizona. Yeah, well, that's just that particular part. Um, there's a lot of beautiful spots, though, for sure. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, I wanted to, to get you to touch on some Antiquitech stuff. Uh, d does this have any connection to do with things like atmospheric energy production and things of that nature? Or could you elaborate a little bit on maybe some examples or historical plausibilities in that regard? Yeah, I think historical plausibility is a good way to go. I mean, so in terms of evidence, we can we can go wax on forever. And I hope you have, you know, t if you have seen some of my other videos we talk about the pan telegraph and technology that's existed for centuries, different kinds of like the Babbage computer, the calculator, um, battery, batteries that have existed before the Baghdad battery, and et cetera. There are tons of examples of technology. And also there are examples of architecture that are using free energy. You go to places like Iguazu in, um, in Paraguay, Argentina, where they have a hydroelectric dam and it's built on top of an old ancient dam that was actually using electricity before that. You have windmills, which are the Dutch mills, because the Dutch were a part of Spain, which were part of Cordoba, and that's why tulip and turban, tulip means turban, and the Dutch had, you know, water mills, and Cordoba had lights at night, which is part of the story is, is that the Arabs had electricity during the Dark Ages, right? Well, apparently that's true. So electricity is a big part of it, you know, and you, the, the Masons, the Freemasons always talk about the more sciences and why in the 1700s they were so excited about electricity because they'd heard about it, you know? So we know this, it's kind of obvious, but 
the, the sophistication of the technology is way more than most people realize. The kind of technology that was available, for instance, a pen telegraph would let you fax an image to someone on the other side of the world instantaneously. And the train station had this you know, in the 1800s. So we know that the train station got this from Italy and that Italy had this from the 1300s and that they had gotten it from a book that the porters had brought from Ireland from the Byzantine. So that originally come from Herodotus' library. So it was from the Alexandrian library that Hypatia had been watching before it was burned. That's pretty great. That means that we have more examples of pre, uh, you know, two millennial, uh, at least old technology than anyone ever thought. Also, there's these lightning rods. Okay, so Benjamin Franklin loved lightning rods. Anything that you saw invented in the first part of the 17th to the 18th century, way more fascinating than you realize. Actually, the first patent is tartric uh, acid. It was a kind of coke ash that they used. So good job, America. But the technology for the lightning rod was originally used in cityscapes in Baghdad. And you have it so that a lightning rod will hit this tower because there's nothing else in this big flat area. There's no trees. And the lightning will then hit this and it will run down to the ground. But it could be caught in something. It could be the energy could be you know, used for something. When I was living in the rainforest, there's lightning storms every day. Every single day, there would be lightning in um, Ataparca. And so what we would do is uh, we would we'd have these you know towers in the middle of the city that would take electricity and then those would run them down the building and then they would go underground and they would ground them into different uh, generators, which apparently were built by Germans in like the 20s or something. And they're still in Peru. And Peru is basically run by the Yakuza. So if it works, it works. So when you start finding out about all these generators and you're like, wait, like the Edison generators that seem so implausible and they were so you know, but Tesla had helped perfect, right? The story starts to make more sense. There were already giant generators. Tesla had helped fix. That's the official story. And that when he did that, the efficiency was through the roof. You know, he was supposed to be promised a million dollars by Edison to do that. Edison never paid him. And that's why the beginnings of the Westinghouse fiasco, which led to the crisis in uh, Siberia, which we think of as the Tunguska affair, but it was really... Um, an explosion that had happened, not from a meteor, but because the same latitude of the uh, island that had been controlled by the Westinghouse experiment was off. And so I think it was like 20 degrees or something like that. So it ended up killing and microwaving a bunch of caribou in Siberia. And there was just no explanation for this anomaly in 1909. So they said meteor, but that was uh, you know part of this resurgence of technology that they were discovering that was as we call Tesla tech, but it's really Tartaria tech. And yeah. um, in general, like most of the technology that they found has been being used. Have you have you come across this idea of something along the lines of like mercury vortex engines or generators and cathedrals or lighthouses? Yeah, it's another good thought about Starforge, right? Is this idea of liquid mercury and these pools that were being used for electric uh, circuits and also for magnetism. Um, mercury is probably, uh, there's a number of reservoirs that they found in Spain next to the star fort in, um, uh, forget, uh, the north, forget which one. Uh, Madrid, maybe? I, I don't know. <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, oh, wait. Aragon, That's... it's in Aragon. My bad. Yeah, it's, it's like, it's like Aragon, it's like Tar Tarragon or something like that. It's near Aragon in the northeast. But they did have a, you know, they found an, uh, an, a, a large mercury reservoir near one of the starports. So we, we're finding more and more evidence of there being giant mercury pools. And this, there's all sorts of speculation for what this is. I, I like the idea of Terrence McKenna's energy uh, circuits. It makes a certain amount of sense. And if, if you think about what we're doing right now with 5G, it's the same tech idea. Like you literally are taking a unidirectional energy microwave and sending it down a certain path. And there are certain areas where you have resonance and there's a lot of value to having um, resonance zones because those zones can then help things to harmonize because when you, and this is the big problem with Chernobyl, right? Like when you go in and out of different frequency um, resonance, then it can cause mutations. So you want to stay in the same frequency all the time, but that transition can be really bad for you or it can be dangerous. So there's, 
there's a lot of evidence there that that technology works. I mean, we're using it right now. So the idea that they were using it then it seems plausible to me. I think the main idea here is to see that we're not the first to come up with these ideas and that there were ways of doing this before us. And that's, I think, helpful when we're trying to come up with solutions for how we can do this ourselves. Because as we're trying to perfect the world and make technology safer, we can kind of imagine how could it have already been done better before. Definitely. Uh, can I ask you kind of a, a sort of, I mean, it's related to technology, but it's not necessarily Tartarian. I'm, I just had heard you touch on this before, but uh, crystals and crystal radio. And if it would be cool if you could explain how, how, like, what is actually the function of crystals and, in the crystal radio and like what what is what's the purpose and how is that working man man you put me on the spot hard okay <laughs> let's see um how would i explain this okay so one of the things is that you're using induction and you have copper and you have a crystal usually so that the energy can like have a cycle so you're using the crystal as a clock because the energy is running through the crystal and it has a flicker and the amount of times it flickers ends up producing a certain amount of energy in a range and i really wish i could explain that way better than that because i i should understand it more and i think i'll bother to learn it so i can make a good video about that but the idea of having a crystal is really part of every single uh, piece of technology. If you look at your uh, chips inside of your computer, there are literally crystals inside of there for clocks. And crystals will be probably part of any sort of technology that we use in the future because you can use it for solid state data as well. The, it's the most close that we are able to do right now uh, of having a path for electrons to follow and also that if we're looking at singularity you know like there's a certain point where things are touching and an electron can't make a path right because it's it's too re regular or too uh, random in every direction you can have a spacer and a spacer is a random directional laser and a laser you can have photonics so through a crystal you can have par density that's shattered at different distances. And when that happens, you have different par densities. You, you, the best way a human sees it is color. So a rainbow is the difference in par density between 180 nanometers and 600 nanometers or something like that. And, you know, depending on your site, if you're a woman in Siberia, or if you're, because some of us are, it's less than that. And what you end up with is uh, the, the capacity to, use seven to eight times as much information at once because you're not just using a pulse you're using a rainbow and so purple can happen at the same time as green so you can have stacked information but that information can also travel you know at the speed of light and so it's a holographic projection of information so crystals are very useful in the, in the future um but in the in the in the last you know, 100 to 200 years, radios have used crystals because they're able to, when you have like a certain amount of electromagnetic force, they're able to conduct and that's, they're able to pick up on, if you're using a certain band of, so when they're using like a ring of copper, like if you make a crystal radio, you, you connect the crystal to this long toilet paper tube of, of copper and you have a pin on the other side, the longer that it cuts between how long because you can either let the whole ring of of uh, copper sit there or you can clip it and so you can only get half of the ring of copper and it's connecting to make a circuit at a shorter point the bigger the smaller the higher the lower the the frequency because the more the copper is insulatory uh, induction and so the more insulatory indu induction that's how low the radio station that you're going to hear is and so that's so it's, it's a kind of a conjunction of the fact that you're using a crystal to pick up the resonance and also the amount of energy that you're holding and inducting in copper so best i got but i hope i hope someone has a better i'm actually have to look that up now i know i love it i i love i just think it's fascinating because it's one little example of something that we literally use in so much technology that we don't think about and we have no idea generally you do but I think most people, we, we don't even know. 
and it's still like even you know i still don't completely know how to explain the functions of a crystal because i don't think everyone understands it i mean what's interesting about a crystal also is it grows right like you can actually literally put a crystal in a bath of the same kinds of material that the crystal is made in like let's say if it's sodium crystal or something put in salt water it will start to grow sheets in the exact same form as before so it's it's probably the craziest thing that we know because it's basically intelligent yeah definitely i think uh the dude's name i think there's a guy named i think marcel vogel or something like that that has something to do with pioneering some early technology with crystals and computer chips if i recall correctly um an interesting thing from a, a, a guy i previously interviewed named doug gabriel he was telling me, because he's really into crystals and all that, and he was talking about the crowns that the royalty would wear and how they would be surrounded with crystals and that it would literally put your brain into, a, like a, I think it was a theta state or something for a, about 15, 20 minutes or something along those lines, and it would, it would get you in that sort of state just by virtue of the, the compression of the crystals in that crown fashion resting on your head i just thought that that was really cool and fascinating yeah i mean crystals in general are used because they're built at a certain uh time and place they're they hold a certain resonance and so they're used for detecting different kinds of radio in general so the idea of them being used by royals is interesting also because royals say that their blood is special and is able to connect them a lot of the time with a special bloodline if you're if, or you know a dragon if you're in china or in england they think your blood is connected to that specific kind of energy right so that sounded again super new age but actually that is a technology that we're using right now we're using crystal radios all the time in order to detect um signals that both we can't hear ourselves right but also can be amplified if we could, because a lot of the time you're not aware of how much you're able to hear these things because they're hitting such a small amount of you that you're not, I mean, all the radio waves around you, if you live near a radio station, I bet you, you feel it more than you realize. So there's, there's a lot to be said about amplification and, and what we can do with that. Yeah. That made me think when you were just saying that there was another guy I interviewed, uh, Roger Lambert, and he was talking about the, the locations that they would choose to build the cathedrals on and how they were particular, uh, like, ley line cross sections and how they would build, like, the nave or, or, or the altar over the cross section or something along those lines and how, say, there's a bunch of different cathedrals that are named, uh, like, St. Thomas Cathedral or whatever, but they're all over in different spots and he was elaborating to the notion that they were using them as some kind of communication so each one that would be um allocated towards a, a different uh a different like an angel or what like a uh, saint michael or whatever saint michael's cathedral like those would be in some fashion have the ability to communicate with each other and then in thinking about what you were saying and then with the crowns and the royalty wearing them maybe that's tapping them in in some fashion i don't know but i think it's fascinating there's a lot of i mean i so a lot of what i try to do with my channel is like focus on the pieces that we have that are like full evidence but there is a lot of speculation about that based on what evidence we have because so many of the cathedrals and buildings that we have are built of uh, crystal the, the skull buildings are one of the ones that a lot of people think about there's all these buildings built of skulls and, and skeletons in europe that have you know blood that also has been put in, into bone um brick that has the, the bone has been smashed and the blood's been put into the brick that has lots of iron and, and rich mineral deposits and eventually what ends up happening is it becomes crystalline and the crystalline structure is built in the shape and then there's music playing there's a resonance pattern this is very similar to what whales have apparently in their brain that is, makes it possible for them to hear and pick up on a vibration from a signal that is like five or 600 miles away. So there, there is this idea of there being kind of internet uh, resonance. And it's also a better one because this idea of there being specific, and this is what it was like in the eighties, I guess, like there were universities that had it. So you would go to 
the singularity you know there was on earth a place or many places that were a singularity but you could leave it and that was great and that's kind of what we could probably have again it's interesting that that was just so recently taken from us now signal is being like can you hear me now we want to cover everything with with every amount of signal but the problem with that is that eventually we lose the 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 individuality you know and the individuality i think is the biggest part of what in this reset the choice there do you want to have a reset where it's a great awakening or a singularity where we all become you know like there are they already are taking rats wiring them to other rats and having them think and hear and see everything the other rats seeing but the problem is one's in la and the other's in japan so you know like this is this is the beginning of that so we should be careful absolutely um you recently did this really cool interview with i forget where she was located um but you're getting to some interesting stuff um do you want to talk about it relates to the tartaria stuff and you're kind of tracking down different individuals and gathering information could you maybe touch on that a little bit and what you're finding with that oh do you mean um in the tartar stannies when i did interviews with the kids in tartaria it was it was one girl um and you were discussing her family lineage and you were talking mm-hmm. to her about her grandfather i think hold on one second that light went out okay cool <sighs> Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so, are you kidding me? I think that bulb's dying. <laughs> All right. Hopefully that stays. Okay. Um, yeah. So, I talked. Uh, let's, start, let's try that again. Um, yeah, so I've been doing a lot of research into Tartaria from thousand years plus, but I hadn't found a lot of things after the Soviet Union. You can find it all the way to the end, right when the Soviet Union collapses, the last of it, and Tartaria into Tatarstan into a state of you know the Russian Federation. Like it's it's a sad ending to the story if that's the end, but at the same time, it's not because we're finding out about it now. So I reached out to some friends of mine who knew some girls and uh their college in slovenia and the, they were from the state of Tatarstan and russian federation so they were more than happy to talk to me and they were interested that we were interested in them they had no idea that or anyone had ever heard of them because as far as they were concerned they had to be russian even though that they were it's kind of like if you said you were american but you were from like you were an indigenous aboriginal from you know like you were the sequoia nation or or some something like that you were not just you were not necessarily just um part of this you know this group so as she started to look into her own family history more to do the research she was amazed too because she said wait so we did have this is crazy we had no idea that our family was like this and this and this. And so eventually, you know, you can watch the episode on my channel, uh, this huge research that she did into mullahs, into what happened to the Russian um, Tartars uh, that were taken, her grandparents that were, at one point, you know, her grandfather was a a Muslim, but as far as she's just like, yeah, I practice yoga. So my idea of Islam I'm, is a little different. Like their, their understanding of what the words meant and what they were doing were very different, but Today, we look at the Arabesque and we say, hey, the Muslims have architecture, math, sciences. Well, this is apparently where it comes from a lot of the time. I mean, we look at Iran, but a lot of it comes from Tatarstan. And the the, the giant mosque uh, floral pattern buildings that are the most beautiful. I mean, and th- in general, the, the Tartar people were, you know, they had 29, 30 years of study in the community to become a mullah before you could be involved with the running of the society, for instance, and all sorts of connections there that we didn't uh, know before. And but then they ended up destroying all the records. Oh, what's sorry. a what's a, mul- a mullah? So a mullah is kind of like a rabbi or a priest or a city official. It's 
it's a it's a it's a person who is educated and esteemed in the society and is accepted as a you know, um, person of uh, command you know and so it's kind of it's hard to explain because to be qualified enough to be saying you consider yourself worthy of helping or having an opinion or being you know it depends on this when you look at the Finnish and Turkish uh, and Tamil language there are 26 cases it's not just you know the his and her and thy and thou there's more formalities because the levels that you deserve have you know, in Japan for instance like to be good enough of a puppet master you have to spend 30 years learning the front of the puppet the back of the puppet and the middle of the puppet so no one could ever say a mullah is just uh you know a voted in or or a, a religious leader or something like that it's like basically it's somebody who spent their whole life in the community in order to contribute back to the community and their whole job really i mean aside from the fact that they're farmers is that they try to make sure that there still is a community in a generation and you know they also teach them about religion and have philosophical views and read books and make sure that the kids learn how to read books i mean it's probably the most complicated thing you know that you can do yeah that's really cool um are, are there any super cool or interesting points that we didn't touch on related to tartaria that you that you think would be cool to throw out there Mm, I guess I did, I did talk about LiDAR. I think that one, one of the main things right now I'm looking into a lot is LiDAR. I guess, I don't know how much we mentioned like underground, but I think that's a big thing to consider as well is that the underground is littered with tunnel systems that are being used by the US government and the Russian government, the Chinese government. Every Everyone, you know, their secret pharmaceutical labs have underground bases now and mining corporations and submarine volcano shafts. Um, but the underground tunnel systems that have already existed are being explored, utilized, and connected to have these giant systems. And there are more interesting things underground than you could ever imagine. Giant systems of already built tubes into uh, cities, right? And we now have uh, NORAD and things like it that we haven't admitted to, but we know exist. Russia has them as well. But there have always been these stories of Agartha and Telos and... Um, Shangri-La, it's starting to make more and more sense that there really is some sort of a, a an underground system of, of caverns that are connected. So that's something to look into as well. Expect if you like start looking into Tartaria, to just type in words like LIDAR and you'll start to see every day more and more cities are being discovered, more and more star forts are being discovered. You'll just find more research all the time. Fascinating stuff, man. All right, well... Uh um are there any last messages or words or anything that you just want to put out there anything you want um go ahead and say what you want well i, I appreciate that you had me on and i hope that people have a chance to look at some of my other videos as well if you type in exertus or andreas exertus or tartaria you'll probably find me on a lot of the platforms on a lot of different people's podcasts and if you go to my youtube or odyssey channel or you go to exertus.com um you will find the link to the channels on exertus.com or andreas.me. But also check out my History Revised documentary. Check out the Glenn Maxwell, Epstein, Echo the Dolphin documentary series. There's a lot of playlists on there. There's a lot of interesting stuff to watch. Uh, 300 or so videos. So I hope you like them. Yeah, a lot of cool breakdowns of just everything. Film, cartoons. I, I want to ask you one more question because you've done a lot of different breakdowns on like DuckTales, for example, or... Mickey Mouse. Have you ever uh, gone into Aladdin? Man, that's a good idea. I haven't yet. I do. I love Aladdin. I mean, it's a great one. I oh, think, man. I think Have you seen lot. all of them? Have you seen the four movies? No, I, three. Dude. Because uh, there's the, the turtle. They're on the back of the turtle. One of the con like the last one where he meets his dad in like the forty King of Forty Thieves, right? And there's, so there's Aladdin, there's Return of Jafar, there's the King of Forty Thieves, and there's a TV series. I don't know, but the one where he goes on the back of the turtle, man, I have to watch them all again. Yeah, I think it, there's a lot of tie-ins with the. There's a book called The Thousand and One Arabian Nights, and totally some alchemical yeah. connections as well. So I think if if you go into that, that'll be amazing. <laughs> but 
a thousand and one nights is brutal i don't know if you you know like basically you know the story right like a woman was married and her husband was killing her uh his wife every night and marrying a new wife and it was her turn and so she tells him a cliffhanger and he's like what tell me the ending she's like i'm tired i'll tell you tomorrow and then he's like ah and the next day she tells me ending but she tells him a new story with a cliffhanger for a thousand and one nights and eventually she's like okay i'm safe yeah it's crazy (laughs) i have the book i have i've only read a little bit on it though i haven't gone deep into it but there's a lot we can talk about and i greatly appreciate uh your time and you coming on here tonight so yeah appreciate it again and everybody check out exertus you could literally just type exertus in your any podcast platform and tons of podcasts are going to pull up or go on the youtube so Ooh, you can type exertus into your gif keyboard and my refaces will come up so wow. yeah That's pretty dope <laughs> <laughs> all right brother well i appreciate you um thank you again thank you man let's do it again soon peace <laughs>